Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Palm Sunday. As Jess said, my name's Joe. Oh, thank you, Tim. All good. Thank you. And uh, this morning, um, we've been just, it's just family service, so everything's going on, right? It's just been full. Let's say let's, it's full. They say never work with kids and animals. We've had the kids. Now come the animals. No, no, that's not true. But there will be something happening. You know, um, as, as we start this time together this morning, uh, you know, there's no kids' church program on, so we're not constrained by time. So the next 70 to 80 minutes are going to be amazing. Um, so brace yourself. No, no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, but Easter is really important. As we come to Easter Sunday, Palm Sunday, sorry, Easter Sunday is next week. I'm getting ahead of myself. As we come to, come to Palm Sunday, it's a really significant time for us as Christians. This whole Easter period is, in fact, the central aspect of our faith in Christ. N.T. Wright, the famous theologian and author, says this about Easter. Christmas itself has now far outstripped Easter in popular culture as the real celebratory, the celebratory center of the Christian year, a move that completely reverses the New Testament's emphasis. We sometimes try in hymns, prayers, and sermons to build a whole theology on Christmas, but in fact, it can't sustain a thing. We then keep Lent, Holy Week, Good Friday, any of those things we do so thoroughly that we have hardly energy left for Easter when it comes, except for that first night and day. Easter, however, should be the center. Take away that and then there is almost literally nothing left. Easter is essential. In fact, he says this later on, take away the stories, the literal record of Jesus' birth. You lose only two chapters of Matthew and two of Luke. But if you take away the resurrection, you lose the entire New Testament and most of the second century church fathers as well. As such, it's a time of year that maybe we as Baptists don't give enough thought and credit to. Maybe we kind of just rush here and there, busy as anything, and then we get to Palm Sunday. And for some of us, it's actually a surprise. Oh my goodness, it's Palm Sunday. That means I've got to buy hot cross buns for Friday. It means I've got a short week. Praise the Lord. Next Sunday, I better have some Easter eggs for the kids. Again, praise Jesus that the temperature's dropped and I can keep them in my cupboard and not in the fridge where they find them and eat them before Sunday. You know what I mean. And we run so full tilt towards whatever's happening in front of us that we hit, to hit Easter like it's a roadblock, like it's a speed bump, like, oh, we're here. And we forget that this is the central aspect of our faith as believers. And so I would love to have practiced Lent. You know, probably a month of self-denial wouldn't have been a bad thing, but um, we, I, we had other things to talk about. But what I'd love us to do is to maybe just spend a week a week preparing. So what I'd like to do today is just talk to you about four very simple, mundane, everyday objects that you will find in your home, in your house, around the place where you live, that I, I hope after this morning will help you prepare yourselves for Easter, to take time, to take stock, to think upon the true, central part of our faith as Christians. As a part of that, after the service, uh, you're going to get one of these. On the way out, make sure you grab one. This is a four-day devotion that Scott McKinnon and I have prepared for you. Four daily devotions designed to be done as a family. Now, when I say family, I mean whoever you find at your house in the morning. If it's a share house, if you're on your own, wherever it is, wherever you stop first thing in the morning for breakfast, maybe it's a, a cafe, wherever it is you go, our, our hope is that you would stop and you would take a moment at the start of Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, just four short days, to take stock of this week, this holy week, this essential cornerstone of our faith. So you'll get one of these on the way out, so make sure you don't, you don't miss that on the way out. But I want to just speak to the, these four everyday items that we're going to um, use as kind of the focal point for our Holy Week preparation. Does that sound good? Seven of you think that's great. The rest of you, this is going to be a long sermon if you don't <laughs> jump in. Okay. So, the very first object that you, I hope, will find around your house, some houses probably more than others, is a stone. Can everyone say stone? stone. Great. Well done. I'm going to, let's start our, our Holy Week reflection with a stone and maybe you're familiar with this idea because we just had the video before but I want to read you a passage of scripture 
that illustrates why stone is the first thing we're going to begin with. So Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. It's the beginning of the Holy Week. It's Easter, that's uh, Palm Sunday, as we step into this passage in Luke's Gospel. And when Jesus had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples saying, go into the village in front of you, where on entering you'll find a colt tie, which no one has ever sat upon yet, and tie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, the owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. They brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they sat Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, a whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the almighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And Jesus answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. So we have Jesus coming into Jerusalem, and this is a a really, really rich image, replete with meaning. In your your sermon notes, there's a whole bunch of references to the Old Testament, what what it means for someone to enter a city on a cult, and it actually has significant meaning. But what I want you to catch is the picture of stones. Say it again, stone. Great. I need a volunteer. Rob Bokheim, would you come on up, just make your way up today, just welcome him up, and Tim, would you bring out some stones for me, please? Come on, Rob. Get a, need to keep clapping. It's in long. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Would you come put these stones in? And Rob, would you come grab a seat? Uh, maybe at the far end of the table over here. Let's just. Now we have a whole bowl of stones. Would you pick up one of those stones and would you just show it to everyone? Okay, if I hold it real still, the camera can get in tight on that. Can, can we? <laughs> Very good. It's a little one. It's a little stone, but it's important. So grab a seat, Rob. You're our stone man. Well done. I'm sorry if you needed him. He's going to be here for the rest of the sermon. Okay. But this is an important thing. These stones are are really important because they set up the whole Holy Week. The people are quoting Psalm 118. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the Pharisees are just freaking out. You can't say this. You can't say this. And, And they shut everything down. But I think it shows us a choice we have as we begin this week of Easter. It shows us a choice we're presented with. We can be like the disciples and we can shout the praises of Jesus. We can prepare our hearts in celebration. Or we can be like the Pharisees and shut it down. But Jesus says if you don't worship, and the very creation around you will have to shout out my praises. The stones will cry out the praises of Jesus. This week, as we prepare... Will we be like the disciples or the Pharisees? Or will we be like maybe those stones on the ground, ready to spring into the praise of Jesus as the moment presents itself? So this week, as you walk out your front door at home, as you see your garden, as there's rocks everywhere, stones on the driveway, I want you to stop and ask yourself, Do I recognize Jesus? Do I praise him as king? Everybody say stone. Stone. Come on, ladder. Well done. Okay, good. That's our first one, stone. Uh, Our next one is going to be a little bit more interesting. Can you say fig? Fig. Fig. That's not too bad. Fig. Okay, we're going to move to another gospel. Now we're going to go to Matthew's gospel. And we're going to read a passage out of there. Because this is progressing through the Holy Week. Now, Uh, Palm Sunday was a Sunday. That's what's just happened. We're we're probably the Tuesday now. And Jesus has been coming in and out of Jerusalem for the week. And we find this really interesting passage in, in Matthew 21. Let me read it for you. In the morning, as Jesus was returning to the city, he became hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but only leaves. And he said to the fig tree, may no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. When the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither at once? Jesus answered them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only will 
you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Now, I need a volunteer who likes figs, probably grown up because they're, they're a mature thing, someone who's probably close to the lovely Maria Ken. Would you come on up? Let's give her a hand as she comes on up. Tim, would you bring out some figs, please? Hey, come on, that's good. So, Maria, would you come and would you take a seat here? There's like mama and papa on the table, and we have some actual figs, not cheap at this time of year, but we found them in fruit at least. And would you like to just have a seat? Would you grab one of those figs and would you hold it up so the camera can see it? Nice to see. And we have a fig. Can everyone say fig? Yeah. Great. Now, feel free at any point to help yourself and, and just eat one. You can even share it with Rob if you like. Okay, so fig. Fig is our second thing that we've got to remember. What was our first one? No. Our second one? Yeah. Great. Okay. The fig. This is a really weird thing, right? Jesus rocks up to a tree and says, I want a fig. There's no figs. He says, die. I could never get the hang of Tuesdays either. <laughs> But there's probably a whole lot more going on here. Jesus is actually making a point. Jesus has been in the temple. He's been to Jerusalem already on the Monday. He's already had that moment where he's flipped over the tables and got very upset with people. Things have shifted from the big celebration of Jesus coming in. And now people are starting to think, oh, what's going on here? Jesus has some pretty strong things to say about Israel and their worship and how they've got things wrong. And so as Jesus comes into Jerusalem and sees the fig tree and he pronounces this judgment over the fig tree, he is figuratively, <laughs> I didn't even think of that, that's not in my notes. Uh, he is figuratively speaking judgment over Israel and Jerusalem for their lack of fruitfulness, for the lack of producing what they should be producing all the time. It wasn't the season for figs, as we find out in one of the other Gospels, but Jesus still expected it because he knew they had the truth. So the question that presents us as we have our figs is this week, as we prepare, what is the fruit of our lives? As we step towards this most important moment of our calendar, what is the fruit of your life? Everybody say fig. Not bad, not bad. Okay, moving right along. Everybody say coin. 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 Not bad. What have we had so far? First one? No. Then? Three. Now? Four. Well done. You guys, this, you're doing great. We're almost there. So we come to another scene in the Holy Week, in this lead up to Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. So Jesus is on his way to the temple, he's made his way to the temple, and he has this really weird interaction with these people who now realize Jesus is a threat to everything that they stand for. And so now in Mark's gospel, so we've had Luke, Matthew, now in Mark, we see this exchange between Jesus and a bunch of people that are with him. And so from Mark 12, and they sent him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. And they came to him and said, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion. For you're not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But Jesus, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, Why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius, a coin, and let me look at it. And they brought him one. And he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is on this. They said to him, Caesar's. Jesus replies, render to Caesar, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Hmm. The coin gives us something very interesting to think about. Okay, so I, need, I have a volunteer already prepared for the coin because she just is so excited. Rosie, my little girl, would you come on up? And Tim, would you bring out some coins? Let's give Rosie a hand as she comes up. Come on, sweetie. It's a family service, so I thought I should sneak my family in, right? Oh, now the, the camera guy's going to hate me for going into the dark. Come on, sweetie. You're doing great. Come and sit over here right beside Maria. And we have... 
You can put it on the table, Tim. Isn't Tim doing a great job, by the way? Yeah. Oh, look at that. So we have a money box with coins, which you can keep afterwards. And there's a coin on top, right? Would you hold up that coin and show everyone whose picture's on it? Do you know whose picture is on the coin? Who? The queen. The queen. Well done. Yeah, isn't it? She's so clever. I'm so biased. <laughs> yeah, give her a hand. Okay, you can put it down now if you want. You can have some fig if you like to, and Rob might give you a stone. Everybody say coin. So what do we have first? Stone. And then? And now? You go. Oh, you're doing great. Okay, we're almost there. We're almost there. The coin is something really interesting. Jesus has already made some comments to people about money changing in the temple, which was more about blocking people's worship than about selling things. But when we get to this incident, this moment with a coin, he says something probably a little more profound than that. He says, give to God what is God and give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And I think as we prepare for this week, as we go towards the Easter weekend, what I believe the challenge for us in this passage is, it's twofold. One, like the stone, will we give to God what is God's? But secondly, will we give to the world what is the world's? And I, th- I want you to think about that a little bit differently in the light of our Love Declared and Love Demonstrated series. You know, there's this whole storyline of the Bible. There's this whole movement right through Scripture that shows God's people going into exile. And when they're in exile, yes, they're under God's discipline and punishment for disobedience. But in the midst of it, God does something with his people that blesses the people around them. And while we're kind of in exile because we're not where we're going to be yet, God hasn't said everything right yet. In the midst of it, we can be like Daniel or we can be like Paul or Peter in the New Testament. Where they go, we can be part of the world. We can give something of our worth to the world to show them who this king is. We can pray for the city that we've been put in. Daniel in exile, seemingly cut off from God. God says, go and pray for the well-being of your city. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, God says, while you're there, plant a garden. While you're in Babylon, plant a garden and give your kids in marriage and pray for the well-being of the city. As we prepare this week, are we giving back to our city, to the people around us that we see every day? Are we blessing them with what we've been given? Do we give to God what is God's and do we give worth to the people around us? Do we pay tax? Are we good citizens? Do we present God to the well-being of our city? Say coin. 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 So what have we got again? Let's try it again. Wonderful. Well, we have one left. As we prepare, there comes to this last scene of the Holy Week, this last moment before the crucifixion of Christ. And it's Jesus' last supper. It's the Passover festival that Jesus celebrates with his disciples. I'm going to read to you from John's Gospel now, from chapter 13. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, And that he had come from God and was going back to God. He rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. He then poured a water basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered, what I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you'll understand. Would you say water? I need one more volunteer. Bill, would you, would you come on up? No, you're not going to make you take your shoes off. It's okay. Just come on up. Let's give Bill a hand as he comes on up. None of these people know anything about this. They've just been absolutely wonderfully humbled to come and do it. Tim, would you bring out the water? So Bill, would you, would you come and sit next to my, my precious little Rosie here? And Tim, would you, would you put out that water for us? Now, Bill, would you, would you grab a seat and you can take the towel out of the bowl, maybe just pour a little bit 
into the bowl and just, just notice that there actually really is water here. <laughs> is there a little bit of water there? Oh, yeah, look at that. Okay, save it. Not too much. We need to do something more. So hang on. So this is what happens. I didn't give him any instructions before. You're doing great. You're doing awesome. Okay, this is our last thing. So what do we start with? Stone. And then? And then? And now? Water. Water. This is a really important moment because this is where things shift for us. The first three things are things that we need to do to prepare for God. But here is where we stop and we see that Jesus prepares us. His disciples sitting around a table, ready for the final meal, not knowing what it meant. People from different walks of life coming together, having seen this craziness of this week, the stones and the fig and the coins, they come to this last moment. And Jesus does something just so radical. He steps into the role of a servant, someone kind of like how Tim's been today. And, and Jesus took time and he washed their feet. And I'm going to ask Tim just to wash these guys' hands a little bit today. That he just served them as I finished this part of the message off. Because here's where it becomes a significant moment for us in our preparation. It stops being about what we can do for God. Or a reflection of how good we can be for him. And this becomes an act of surrender. We have to let him do something for us as we prepare for Easter. The disciples let Jesus serve them. A demonstration that he'd come to serve all of humanity. To the point, as it says later in the book of Philippians, that he would serve humanity to the point of utter humiliation, death on a cross, the lowest of low. And as he washed their feet, the crucifixion was just a few short hours away. The disciples let Jesus serve them in order that he might be glorified, exalted, lifted up and made king over all humanity, all creation, all of the universe. And I believe as we prepare for Easter, Jesus asks us, will you let me wash you? Unless you let him come and wash you, you can have no part in him. And maybe you don't understand it all, but will you let him wash you? Where did we start? What was our first thing? Stone. Our second thing? Third? Last? Preparation for Holy Week. Would you, would you thank our, our lovely, wonderful members of the Holy Week? Thanks, guys. You can head back to your seats. Thank you, Rosie. Well done. You can keep the dollar. Yeah, good work. Off you go. Head back down to mum. You can go with Maria. She'll show you. Go that way. Go that way. You're doing great. So our response from this point forward, I would ask you and challenge you that let your week now be a preparation, a time of getting ready, a time of sharing with your family. As Pastor Rick read out earlier, that beautiful promise from Deuteronomy, as you declare the goodness of God, share it with your family. As you get up in the morning and eat breakfast, as you get ready for bed, as you go to work and come home, as you do anything, speak of this God that we serve. Remember, as you walk into your garden, as you eat a butt of fruit, as you spend some money this week, and as you wash your hands, as you cleanse your body, would you remember this week that we come to a weekend next weekend of the utmost significance. Jesus longs our hearts to be prepared, but more than anything, that we would let him prepare us. My challenge to you is to grab that devotion and spend this week getting ready, preparing your family for Easter. Let our praises point to the one who deserves it. Let our lives be examined for their fruit. Let our priorities and desires be given to the ones who deserve them and the ones who will be blessed by them. And let us, let him wash us clean. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you at this moment, Lord. We sung those words before you're in the waiting. And Jesus, we think back to 2,000 years ago where you knew what was coming and you spent a week of waiting and preparing. And Lord, we would love to echo that this week. 
Lord, if we hold true to you, to the confession, the declaration of you as Lord, then, Lord, the least we can do is prepare our lives for this beautiful, special and significant moment. So I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would just do something in our families in this church. In this community, this big family, would you come and would you step into our little families, Lord? Would you just give us a point of focus this week? That we would find ourselves back here on Friday, prepared and ready for the full, true, glorious revelation of your sacrifice on our behalf. We bless your name and we thank you. Amen.